Hello again and welcome back to the live show here at IBC 2013. With me today is Simon Jarvis from Digital TV Labs. Hi Simon. Hiya. Um, we're going to talk a bit about Digital TV Labs first, the history of the company. Who is Digital TV Labs? So Digital TV Labs started in 2005. Uh, we're based in the UK. We are digital media and device testing specialists. So anything that's capable of receiving content, handling it, software that can do that, we can, we can test. We have products and services for software testing. We work with device manufacturers, broadcasters, operators, software vendors, anyone involved in the, the process of getting content to a user. Okay. I understand you have an Asian office as well, is that correct? We do. We have an office in Hong Kong um, where we also provide testing mm -hmm. um, and sales and support for customers in the Asian region. Okay. So when you say manufacturers, though, you work with manufacturers, are you talking about CE manufacturers that people here would have heard of or really need sort of broadcast? So what's Both. We, we work with CE vendors, the big A brands that people would have heard of. We also work with the brands that people won't know, huge manufacturers, OEMs, ODMs, yeah, okay. who then brand their devices as other people. As well as that, the broadcasters, the operators, people making niche software to run on devices. Sure. Okay. So, what is a conformance regime? So, a conformance regime is a way of ensuring that a device is going to work. Basically means that the expectation the consumer has for what they're going to get from their device matches with the reality. They can, they can take it home, connect it to their service, connect it to their other device, however they intend to use it, and it works in the way they expect. Okay. okay. But, and could you give me an example then? Say you're, uh, you want to conform to CI Plus, for example. I'll yeah. come back to what CI Plus is in a minute. What would that process actually entail? And, and specifically, what would your role be in that process? So for CI Plus in particular, the, the body who define the standard um, have created a set of minimum requirements that a device needs to meet. We've then worked with them to analyze those requirements and create test cases. Okay. So then a manufacturer that wants to build a CI Plus device will come to us. Um, we have a product that they can use to run testing on their own device, mm -hmm. part of their development. Once they're happy, everything's going well. They then submit the device to us as the official test house. We can run the tests and we can say to them, either you've got a few areas to look at, or, yeah, great, everything's fine and this works. Then what they do is they submit to the CI Plus route of trust um, and they can get the device certificates, which they can then use to deploy their device in the market. Okay. And that means that any device that has got the CI Plus certificates and the CI Plus logo yeah. will work. It will okay. play nice with the other CI Plus devices and work as the consumer expects, but also as the content providers expect. Okay. So it will protect the content and honor all of the security rules okay. as well. Okay. So everyone wins. What is CI Plus? So CI Plus is an extension of the common interface specification. Um, it came around in the late 90s um, and is a way for a device to push the, the part of the device that's doing conditional access out into a separate module. Okay. So a consumer can buy an off-the-shelf device, a TV from a, a brand that they know and they're familiar with, and then rather than getting a specific set of box from an operator, they can get a conditional access module, or CAM. They then put that into their device, the two devices link up, and they can receive conditional access services. CR Plus built on the foundation of CI mm. um, by adding in the ability for better fine-grained control of the outputs of the device, so keeping the content providers happier. Also adding in interactivity in the form of MHEG-5 yep. to enable operators to put their logo, put in some advertising, and then to start offering additional services. So CR Plus provides for the use of an internet connection on a host. Cam can talk to that, access content, descramble it, and then make that available. So operators can put sort of premium content, extra services, and really sort of make the most of that opportunity. So could you give say could you give me an example within a given market of how that would operate? Say if you take Freeview, for example, as a, as a DTT free system, how would CI Plus work in that model? So rather than a consumer working in a, a vertical model and getting a set-top box from the operator, what they would do is they would get a CI Plus compliant TV, um, so looking for the logo in the store, mm -hmm. or operators quite often may list a load of devices they know to work with their specific cam. Once the consumer finds a the model they like, they get that. And instead of paying their subscription and getting a set-top box, leasing a set-top box, however the operator chooses, 
they, they just get the module. Okay. And that would enable them to connect that and get the premium services from that operator. Main advantage of it, uh, which is realized much more in mainland Europe, is they can then use one device for multiple operators. So if you have a hybrid device with a triple tuner that gives you cable and satellite, mm -hmm. you can just have a cam from your cable operator and satellite operator, plug that into your TV, and the whole lot works with the same remote. So you don't yeah, have okay. separate set-top yeah, yeah, boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you, yeah, yeah. Where's that remote gone? It's just going through your TV, and user interface that you know and you're used to. Okay. Very easy. I understand that my knowledge of CI Plus is, is, is somewhat inferior to yours. Um, but I understand with CI, before CI Plus, there were issues with when you were taking the, the programming around the, the security of that content, the encryption. So yeah, the main, of the main advantage of CI Plus over CI is in CI, the link between the module and the host mm. was open. Yeah. And so there's a potential for someone who knew what they were doing to redirect that, stream it online, copy it, save it, do other things with it. With CI Plus, the, the new advantage of that is that that link's then encrypted and protected. So the, the encrypted content comes into the host, which passes it to the module, still encrypted. Mm -hmm. The module decrypts that broadcast encryption and then re-scrambles it with a local encryption the host can understand. Okay. So the whole broadcast chain from the operator through to the consumer is protected. There's no link that it can be tampered with. And again, you're always great. I understand. Is CI Plus now under the auspices of the DVB? Is that correct? It is. Yeah. The the CI Plus LLP created the the first version of the CI Plus specification. Um, they then extended that through to uh, version 1.3, which mm -hmm. was um, became mandatory for testing last year. Uh, then they kind of felt like their work is done, so they passed it back to DVB to develop it and extend it. So DVB have been working on CI Plus 1.4 which brings further extensions to the standard to allow multi-stream is one of the main bonuses. So someone is able to watch one channel and record another, mm -hmm. or stream it to another device within the home, or do something else to kind of consume more content at the same time. Okay, okay. And you, you mentioned there that Sky Plus is, is certainly potentially more prevalent or going to be more prevalent in Europe, the take-up of it. Where are we at generally with the take-up of CI Plus? What, what's the market conditions in that regard? In terms of receivers, it's very strong. If you go and buy a, an IDTV in Europe now, new chances are it's got CI Plus in it. There's a new European law that means any device with a screen size over 19 inches... Is it 19 inches now? Yeah, okay. ...has to have a, okay. um, a socket for an open interface. And so the, the industry field, CI Plus, meets that requirement. Mm -hmm. And so manufacturers have to do that to comply. Okay. So that makes it a really appealing prospect for operators because there's already that existing bed of devices out in the market to launch new services. What about other parts of the world? Does it have a play in Asia, for example? Or is it we have been speaking to a few people. We know some operators in China have considered it. Um, and part of the advantage of CI Plus 1.4 is moving away from the solid link to DVB and enabling it to access IP content as well, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, which will then open up many more markets. Okay. Another uh, technolog technological development or, or standard, if you like, that you're being involved with is MPEG Dash, I understand. That's correct. What, That's what, what is MPEG Dash? MPEG Dash is uh, dynamic adaptive streaming. Um, and that means that an operator is able to make the most of the bandwidth they have available to their consumer. So if suddenly the network becomes a bit more congested, perhaps you have several users in the same household doing various different things, everyone's on tablets, different devices then using MPEG Dash, the technology can reduce the bandwidth so that okay. the um, available bandwidth can be used. The video will, won't sit there buffering and just stall. It'll just reduce the, content, the quality of the content and you'll carry on being able to, okay. to watch it. Okay. What stage are we at with MPEG Dash? Where, where... So the Dash standard is, has been finalized. Um, it's a very big standard. It covers lots of different codecs um, and it's very wide. So a number of organizations have created their own profile. So Dash themselves have the Dash 264 profile, mm -hmm. um, which is the one that matches in with the test harness that we have. And as well as that, the HPB TV forum have created a Dash profile. And we also have a test harness for that as well. When you say created a, a, a diff a, how different are the profiles? And so they're reasonably similar. It's just they, they specify certain parameters such as the the frame rates that need to be supported, or the resolution, or the codecs that are used. Okay. And so for HPB TV, that's all about the over-the-top provision to 
uh, receivers um, and using the HPP TV standard for interactivity. Okay. And then Dash 264 is a much wider profile that can be used for, for any kind of connected device. Okay. It must be, uh, and, uh, within MPEG Dash, who are the players involved in it? Who's, where's the support coming from? So MPEG Dash is huge. It's all across yeah. the market. It's, it's similar to the um, HLS and the other streaming methods. So the, the same kind of players who are involved in that, so the like real networks, Apple, big companies are involved. Digital TV Labs are part of the Dash Industry Forum, yeah. who are the body that are driving the Dash standard um, and continuing to develop that to take into account HEVC and um, H.265 and the new advances. Okay. It must without naming names here, and I, and I use the term political in the, in the, in the widest sense, it must be, you're dealing with a lot of standards bodies here and, and with a lot of interested parties. It must be, it must be a, a, you must have to take quite a flexible and negotiable approach on occasions in these situations. So for us, generally, we are not too interested in prodding the standard in particular directions. If we realise that there are things in a standard that are likely to cause problems with interoperability, mm -hmm. then we'll speak up. But because we're not deploying products to conform to these standards, we're more interested in a sort of monitoring role and okay. consulting and advising. It's more when the standards bodies have the, the manufacturers and the operators and the people who intend to, to make use of this, deploy products, deploy services, mm. they then have the agenda to, to drive the standard to cover the, the use case that they have in mind and to really make the, use, the most of it. Okay, okay. Now in terms of, you've mentioned connected TV there and I know, I know it's not absolutely your primary OCI plus more so, but HBB TV you mentioned, what is HBB TV? So it stands for Hybrid Broadcan Broadband and Broadcast Television. It's, it's a way of providing interactivity um, in conjunction with a broadcast. Okay. So it's really taken hold in Europe very strongly. Um, it's deployed all across mainland Europe, um, also then spreading further into Russia and the Far East. Okay. Um, and there are some um, the plans within Turkey also, that Southeast Asia are looking into it. Okay. It's a way that operators can can provide extra content, video on demand. They can provide applications such as sort of voting on a Saturday night, links to a preview of next week's show, and just that kind of extra value mm. within the same portal. So you don't get the user second screening on something else. I was going to say, it's, it's more you're of a You're still engaging yeah, with the yeah. operator yeah. and the, your main provider. Mm. And so they can sort of keep your attention and target you with things, their, their messages and what they want to. This, this is a slightly more wider question because I have heard that, that yes, HBB TV comes at it at least as much from a broadcast angle as it does a broadband angle, allowing broadcasts to have a greater sense of control and keeping... How important do you think that is going forward for broadcasters? You know, it's Very. Consumers are not happy with... I watch this program when it is on. But they want to watch their program whenever. And mm. so HPB TV provides for video on demand okay. and additional services. And then plus, now it's possible to tie HPB TV in with CR Plus. That offers the option of premium services using DRM or conditional access on mm -hmm. the cam to either protect the content or make use of that to target what's in the application to the specific consumer. Because okay. you can get information about their smart card, you know who that is, you know what their other subscription is. So the operator um, portal can show them things you might think they like. Mm. And so as well as it being a flexible solution for them to, to watch things as and when they want, you can target the kind of things that they're interested in as and when they want. Okay. So it's so you're bringing, think, you're bringing the, the, the sort of metadata of the internet, if you like, and the metrics of the internet, but within a broadcast experience. That's right. And yeah. it, because HBB TV is based on existing technologies, it uses a um, thing called CEHTML, which is a cut down HTML. HTML, yeah, sure. Um, and so for device manufacturers to implement that, it's very straightforward. Okay. They don't have to completely revolutionize the way they're doing it. And then it also means that anyone wishing to deploy apps and platforms, that's straightforward as well. So it's a nice open standard, easy to use for everyone that gives extra benefit for the consumer. And I understand Digital TV Labs has been fairly fundamentally involved in the development and, and, and sort of, yeah. yeah. We're, we're very heavily involved in HPV TV. Um, we're involved in the steering group. We're involved in the testing group. The, they've launched an official test regime um, and over half, uh, just around half of those tests were created by Digital TV Labs. Mm. We have a test harness for HPV TV on a receiver as well as HPV TV and Dash and HPV TV combined with CI Plus. Mm. Okay. You work with 
obviously other players in the market. It's like Dolby. You have a relationship with Dolby. What's what, what's what's that? Then what's that all about? We work closely with Dolby on a number of um, our products. So our Legada test suite for HBB TV mm. has got tests for Dolby audio. So when that yeah. Dolby content is delivered using HBB TV, checking that the receiver is capable of decoding it, playing it back, and um, adhering to the Dolby metadata. Mm -hmm. Um, we also can offer pre-certification testing for Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus. So as part of the audio testing services that we have, we can work with a manufacturer to take mm -hmm. their system, go through the, the official Dolby tests with our specialized test equipment, and then generate a report that they can submit to Dolby okay. in order to get their certification. Okay. You have an, so you mentioned we mentioned earlier on a Hong Kong office. How important is it in your world to have a Hong Kong office or, or, or an Asian office? So our, our Hong Kong office is key. Large amounts of the supply chain for set-top boxes and mm. TV manufacturers are based in Shenzhen in China and all around the Southeast Asian region. Okay. So by having our offices across the two continents, we're able to work with customers on their back door. We can provide them with the same time zone, same language technical support. Mm makes it much easier in terms of shipping people or devices around the world. Hong Kong has great trade agreements, so our customers can easily get there. We, a real value-added service that we have is our hosting service. So people, we don't just test their device, give them a report and say, here you go. We get them through the certification, we bring them in, we can take them through the tests, we can say, it's not working, this is why, this is what it should be doing, and this is how to tweak it or this is what the standard says. In practice, we know that the broadcast is not quite like that, and this is what you should be doing. Mm. And we can bring our expertise, and we can bring that with our Hong Kong team. Okay, okay. And then, how generally, uh, this is again a slightly wider look at the market, but we do have a plethora of services available, connected TV being obviously part of that. What is the role of a, of a broadcaster going forward, and how important actually is fundamentally the content in all of this? Because it's one thing that we don't, hear that much about in Hawaii here. We hear a lot about the technology, but not the content so much. Well, that's key. The, the technology that we're talking about is all about getting the content to the user. Yeah. So if there is no content, then they're not interested and they'll look elsewhere. Okay. And now that content is available from so many different sources, it's not just the traditional broadcast. There's so much over the top content. People mm. want to be able to look at UView um, and see all of this other content um, that's available on the web and, and to access that easily where they want it, when they want it. Sure. Uh, so this is a conversation I've having with um, some other manufacturers, I know you're not a manufacturer, but other key players in the market, that the role of manufacturers has changed in a way, and now they're becoming more consultative in what they do, and almost in some ways acting as, as, as mini SIs. How has, has the role of digital TV labs changed over the years, and how much sort of consulting do you do in this process and advising companies before they're almost at the dipping a toe into the water stage of the market, do you know? Yeah. So we do a lot. Um, we work very closely with our customers and a large amount of what we do is advising them on the emerging technologies that we are working in and the ones that we see as being successful and being a good one. So HBB TV was a prime example. We've been working with that for quite a long time. Mm. When that came along, we saw the opportunity there and realized this is going to be big. This is going to take off. And so we've developed our Legada harness to, to help manufacturers to deploy it. Okay. And as with all these things, it's very chicken and egg. The technology will come along and the operators are not too keen to deploy it until there are devices that will support it. And the device manufacturers don't see the point in implementing it if there are no services. <coughs> sure. So you always you need someone to be able to take the plunge and say, so yeah, we, we think this is going to work. This is a good technology. It brings benefit to the consumer. And so where we see our role is kind of attending all the standards bodies and looking at what's coming, talking to all of our customers, broadcasters we work with, the operators, mm. talking to, to government and finding out what different countries are planning I, to do. I've got to tell us more about that, yes. And so yeah. when new people are looking to launch regimes and they, they don't want to launch something that's been around for ages and is going to become obsolete, they want to start gearing up to launch the new and the exciting. Mm. And so we'll then work with them and consult with them and help them to set up um, getting the right technology for their needs and then helping them to test it and make sure the device is there they're deploying and the platform is going to work and consumers will be happy with it and they're not going to be ringing up complaining. They're sure. going to go away with a good service. <laughs> Actually, the next question I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask to our next interviewee as well. Um, do we have a slightly, perhaps an overly westernised view of the market in the sense that what we can afford 
in the, in the UK or, or Western Europe, in terms of set-top box or receiver capabilities, is not what you could do in, in parts of Asia and certainly parts of Africa. Do we, do we have a slightly, I don't want to use the word condescending, but an overly westernised view of things? It, there is a tendency towards that because people know what's familiar to them. Mm. So they can see how that's going to work and they think, that, yeah, that makes sense. I might use that at home. So what you really need are the people who can sort of take a step back and think, actually, that is a good product. It's just not for this market. And also, that drives innovation. So if there are markets where people can't afford to pay hundreds of euros for a new set-top box, then they have to find better ways of doing it and finding low-cost ways and mass market. And people still want to be able to do the same thing. People are still similar underlying they want to watch things they enjoy and they want to do it in an easy fashion Mm. and so if manufacturers are able to make devices capable of doing that that meet that market then they're going to be successful and so we try to to help them to understand the market and to get devices that are going to work (coughs) excuse me um how involved i mean it may not be your area of expertise but mheg as a technology uh there's possibly still potential for that in other parts of the world, do you think, because it's, because it's so low cost and proven and has a strong conformance regime? Yeah, yeah, we are finding that. We, MHEG is involved in the CR Plus regime as well, <coughs> so it's a yeah. mandatory part for CR Plus receivers, so that's, that's really helped with its break out of the UK. So MHEG's very heavily used in the UK. Sure, you know, Preview, um, yeah. And has taken off in um, Australia, New Zealand, some in South, um, South Africa. Some of the Southeast Asian markets are considering it, toying with it, but my personal opinion is that HPTV is a bit more likely. It, it offers a, a richer interface. You can do a bit mm. more with it. Again, it, it has that base on the, the existing proven technologies. It does need a bit more power. Um, it's not quite as sort of low end as MHEG, um, but that interactivity to a consumer is something that people are very interested in. Okay. Being able to personalize their experience a bit, provide feedback to an operator, and so the, okay. there's definitely a place for both. Okay. You mentioned it briefly earlier on, but Legada, that's your core product. How, how fundamentally is that structured? What's, 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 what, any current developments with Legada? Yeah, Legada is our test harness. Okay. Uh, and so it's a way of exercising test cases on a device. The tests we have in Legada, we have a test case Legada for HPB TV, which as we talked about, designed for testing broadcast devices. Sure. We've then extended that. We have Legada for HPB TV and CI+. Yeah, I noticed that, yeah. So okay. that's testing the... Uh, HPB TV have defined a series of APIs that can be used with the SAS resource of CR Plus to communicate between the CAM um, and the HPB TV stack okay. to um, control content, to find out a bit more about who the user is and personalize it for them. Okay. Then we've also extended Legada into the Dash area. We have Legada for Dash, um, and that's able to test any form of Dash client whatsoever. So it could be a tablet, it could be a mobile phone, it could be software on a laptop. Anything that has a browser can hook up to our Legada system. We can take it through its paces and confirm that the Dash client on that device is able to do everything required by the Dash profile. So how important are conformance regimes then in the market? We think the key. uh, An operator with a platform backed by a strong logo is going to work. The consumer can go into a shop they see something they recognize, buy that device, take it home, and it works. Okay. If they don't have that, then they'll take the device home and it doesn't work. They either phone up the manufacturer, mm. the shop they bought it from, or the operator. All of those people will try to pass the blame to someone else. They'll say, oh, no, it's your operator. It's, sure. your, it's your manufacturer. We didn't make it. Yeah, maybe they won't work together. And all of those people need to have someone answering the phone. Um, they get the returns, they get people cancelling their subscription, and it's, it's not good for business. Sure. If that device has been tested in advance and it's known to work, then the consumer can take it home and just use it. Just plug okay. it in and they have that, that experience of quality and it, and it working. I mean, how fundamental was that to, to, the free, to Freeview, for example, in the UK, the rollout of Freeview? So that's worked really well. The Freeview digital tick for the switchover. People know what that is and mm. they, they understand if I want to get Freeview services, I buy a receiver with a Freeview logo. Same across the rest of Europe. CI Plus works based on a logo. Everyone knows the Dolby logo. We also work with DLNA, um, the interoperability. Um, So two devices with DLNA logo, different manufacturers, they will work with one another because the test regime has been designed in such a way that it goes through everything they need to do and checks that it is working. I'm glad you brought up DLNA then because I'd actually forgotten about that temporarily. What, What is DLNA? So DLNA um, is a Digital Living Network Alliance. 
And it's a method for sharing content around a home network. Okay. So someone can have a Windows media player on their PC, got their video files, whatever they want on there, and they can stream it to their tablet. Mm. Um, or they can send it to their TV. Um, or if their camera supports DLNA, they can print to a DLNA printer direct from their camera. They don't have to find the right cable or fiddle around with it. Mm. Um, and it's a way that a load of devices from different manufacturers all interoperate with one another. And because it's based on such solid testing, to get that logo, the okay. device has to be tested against the, the known references, it's tested with the test tools, and they know that it is going to work. That must be a massive set of test tools, though, isn't it? Or, or, or complex, or co and politically complex to have got to this stage? It, must be it is complicated, but the, the test <coughs> tools have been designed in such a way that they test as efficiently as possible. Sure. So wherever we can, testing is done, batch processing, automation, tests run one after another. Ideally, lots of our testing can be left overnight. Um, or testing is kind of focusing on the real key areas, and so we which are, the, what, what are, what, in your It depends view? on the standard. So DLNA, a, a real key thing, is finding other devices. Yeah. If you take one home and you've got a player and you try and find your server and it can't find it, it's failed at the first hurdle. In, in a Bluetooth you, you can't style. Get <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then so <coughs> CR Plus, the key areas are security and they're sure. making sure the content's protected. Dolby, you're looking more at the, the metadata and checking the audio. Sounds okay, it doesn't have glitches, it's not mm. clicking, things like that. What stage are we at with DLNA? Is it, is it, is it out there now? Is it all happening? Yeah, or DLNA has been deployed for a number of years. It's okay. very successful. People know the logo now. And that's, that's an example of a testing regime that has, has worked well. Mm. Um, people know what it means and know what it does. DLNA is constantly being extended by the Alliance. They are launching their CVPT, CVP2 um, certification early next year. Um, and that's their commercial video profile, okay. which enables them DLNA was originally looking at sharing kind of user-generated content, people's own photos, home videos, things like that. Yeah. The idea behind this is that a service operator can have a, a gateway device in the home that receives a broadcast or receives content over the IP, and then it can share that around the home to multiple devices using DTCP IP, protecting that content. So again, the content providers are happy. Um, they've also introduced the remote UI based on HTML5. Okay. So that means that the operator can personalize it. Yeah, um, sure. So someone can use their tablet, connect to their set-top box from their operator, see their logo, see the UI that they recognize and they know how to use whichever device they're using, be it their phone, their tablet, their second TV. Okay. And it's a real exciting proposition. So yeah. lots of operators, particularly, it's very strong in the US and we've been yeah, talking I'm going to ask you about geographically Europe. where it's, yeah. DLNA is based in the US and it's got very strong hold there. Um, there's an FCC mandate that comes into effect next year, mm -hmm. um, which means that operators in the US have to make their content more readily available to users. And okay. DLNA is an ideal way for them to do that, and they're okay. fully embracing that and making the most of it. Okay. As a result, the European operators are, are interested, finding out more, and so we're seeing it spread over here as well. Probably, probably my final question here. You, you more so than me. We're technologically literate people, you particularly. And yet, at the moment, the uh, broadcast television internet market for the average person, it's average person, average technology, it's quite a confusing situation. Uh, how important is, are things like DLNA to give an integrated experience rather than, you know, 79 remote controls and various interfaces and so on? That's the thing. People want a nice, simple solution. They want to just take it home and it to work. They don't want to read through a 38-page manual to mm. find out exactly what they have to connect where. They just want their device to talk to another one. And when mm. it can't, they just kind of get a bit frustrated and, and give up. Yeah. And if the thing they're trying to do is an opportunity for them to upgrade their package or buy an extra service, that's lost business and sure. lost revenue. And so sure. having a, a solution that someone can just easily use, um, particularly older generations as well. Mm. People nowadays are a bit more technically literate. Kids coming out of school are, are happy to play with gadgets oh, and fiddle with it. Yeah, yeah. Talking to people like my grandparents, they would rather have something it just works. They can just say, I'd like to watch that now. They don't want to know whether it's coming from satellite, or oh. terrestrial, or IP. They just like to watch that after they've had their dinner. And they just want it straightforward. Yeah, absolutely. My father, I remember my father saying to me, I must get, we must get digital TV. Some's are going to switch off the analog. Yeah. You have got digital TV. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's that sort of situation. One last one. User interfaces for consumers, how important is that? Because often I look at the ones my parents have to use on their television, and it's, it's pretty awful for the, mm. 
how, how important is the user interface? And you mentioned the branding issue there with yeah. the DNA. How important is that? So that's something that operators are really keen on, um, particularly having people know that they're, they're in their portal, they're with a bit that they recognize. It comes back to, to making it easy for people as well. Mm. If someone's used to using one device, um, then they want to be able to use it in a way that they, they know. And so having an APG that looks the same on whichever TV you're using, something mm. you can do with CR Plus, with the DLNA remote mm. UI, that, that's great for an operator. Um, as well, having that branding, having the name that they know, mm. the opportunity to put some advertising in. But yeah, making it straightforward. Because again, if, if things are fiddly and you have to go through eight layers of settings just to where are my photos, or sure. if you want to look at your server and you think oh, I want to open a video that I've got on there, you go to your video folder and then step down through that and then think, oh, actually, no, there was that photo in this folder I want to look at. If you then have to go back and say, no, sorry, from the start, I wanted a photo instead, and you're just left for, oh, this is, this is not efficient and it's frustrating and, and people just stop using it. And sure. when something's easy and you don't have to think about it, don't have to worry about it, it's successful. People sure. find that a sure. nice device to use. Sure. I, I, I like one, one last final question here. Are we still going to have broadcast television in a decade's time? Or are, you, I think, are we going to be looking at, you know, fairly, it's certainly in developed markets, IP delivery? What do we... Maybe. As, as connection speeds get better, that could well be the way. At the moment, broadcast still has the edge on being able to just dump vast amounts of data out mm. um, without being restricted by how many people in the same household are using it. Sure. But then it, it also doesn't have that built-in return channel, so you need the IP yeah. if you want to do yeah. any targeting, any on-demand. Sure. Um, so that there's a place for both, definitely. IP may well be, as we know now, it's becoming more dominant. Yep. Where that will go in the, in the future, I don't know. Okay. Lastly, where can people find you at IBC this year? So we're over in Hall 2. We've got our stand there. We're in uh, A21. Yeah. Come over. We've got demonstrations of our Legada test harness uh, for okay. HPB TV, for CR Plus and for Dash. Okay. We have our CR Plus test tool. and. Come on over, have okay. a chat, say hi, and um, we can tell you more about what we do. That was interesting, Simon. Thanks a lot for that. No uh, thanks a lot for watching. We'll be back with you shortly and enjoy the show.